We're back to live. We're at Trader Village Houston Comic Con. Oh, yay! And uh, today I have a special guest right here, Mr. Dan Frega. How Hello, you doing, friends. Dan? And behind doing him is well. Jerry. Hi, hey, Jerry. He's our he's our backup. Dan, I want to thank you for coming on. Of and he's going to do a special live, one drawing a day, every day, no matter what. And here we have people. I'm going to take the comments off for now. But look, we have Jen Phillips. We have Justin. Hi, guys. We have Amy. We have Australia. We have Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm going to let Dan take it over. One more time. I'll put you on because I didn't get your happy, handsome face. There he is. There's the handsome What's devil. What's up, gang? Dan how, how, Dan, how do you know me? I know you from uh, television in the 80s. I used to watch your show and you inspired me to want to draw and draw every day. So here I am drawing more every day. Let's um, let's jump into things. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about manifesting our imagination, which is what we try to do every day. And the thing that makes you, the artist, the most powerful creator in the universe is that there's only one of you and your imagination is one of a kind. Now, what we want to do with drawing is be able to harness that power and be able to take what's inside of your mind and bring it out on paper. And the best way we can do that is with building blocks. And those building blocks are all around us. They're simple shapes and forms. We have the cube. We have the sphere. Looks like a circle, but if we put a little shading on it with a shadow, it becomes a sphere. We have the cylinder. And we have the cone. Now what I try to do when I observe the world around me is I try to see how these shapes make up the things around me. But another thing that we want to do, and it's something that Commander Mark talks about, is making three images, the things around us, making them seem real, giving them depth. Now, in order to create depth, you have to use different ingredients called depth cues. Depth cues. Different depth cues include overlap, contour, foreshortening, my spelling might be wrong here. No, that looks good to me. Perspective. And shadow. Or shading. Now, let's talk about the concept of overlap. Yeah, this is great. This is great. So overlap, how it creates depth is simple. If it overlaps, if one thing overlaps the other, it gives the impression that the overlapping form is in front of the other. So if I drew that, those same shapes in the same size, but did this, the idea is that this circle form is in front of that. By overlap, we're giving the viewer the idea that this is in front of that, giving a, an illusion of depth. Now where contour comes into hand is based on something called the viewer's vanishing point or eye point. So if here's your horizon, that's basically where our eye is. If I was to be uh, sitting, my eye would be here. If I was standing, my eye would be here. So if my eye, let's say my eye fell upon a person's chest. So here's a, a very crude drawing of a, of a person standing there and this vanishing point and this horizon are right there on that person's chest. Hello Brazil. If I drew someone further away and I kept that horizon line on their chest, the illusion is that person is the same size but they're further away and I can do that again here by drawing someone even closer to the camera but we have the illusion of depth here. It's so cool here. Because of the vantage point. Now, why your vantage point is important for the word contour is if I have 
a horizon line here and I have something as simple as a cylinder, this is where my, line, my eye is, the top of that cylinder is above my eye and the bottom of this cylinder is below my eye and you can see that this curves this way and this curves this way. These contours are based on the relationship to this thing. So above curves, as it gets closer to the horizon, it flattens out and then it curves this way, giving the illusion of form. So that's how contour works. So back over here, when I did this sphere and I did this cylinder, my rendering goes along with the, the idea of the contour here. Now, the way foreshortening works, I use the idea of something that we all know very well. We know uh, heads because we look at faces all day long and we know hands because we use them as, as our, uh, our, our instrument to ex ex execute our will. So generally speaking, if I had a, a, my head and a hand next to it like this, the head is usually bigger than the hand. <coughs> But I see many times people do drawings with something like the hand coming towards us where they're trying to make the hand smaller than the head because in their, they know that the hand is smaller than the head in real life. But with foreshortening, as the hand gets closer to the viewer, the eye uh, sees it larger. So if I was to draw, say, uh, Superman flying towards us, and I'm going to draw these as crude shapes just for the sake of speed. He's coming towards us. And then I'm going to have this other hand going away from us as like he's flying like this and his knee coming towards us. Now, if this was Superman, we see how big his, his hand is. It's bigger than his head. And how big this hand is, it's way smaller and way, way smaller than this one. That's because as they recede in the distance, much like you saw in this drawing, as things get further away from the viewer, they get smaller. See that head is bigger than that head, is bigger than that head. That's the idea of how foreshortening works. And if you try to keep with the rules of what you think you know, that the hand is smaller than the head, and you had Superman flying at the viewer in the same way. See how that just doesn't look as dynamic and right? So that's foreshortening. Now perspective is, we're gonna go back to the thing that we just talked about with the horizon line. Perspective is based off of our horizon line, where our eye is, and then we have vanishing points. So we're gonna do a simple two point perspective now where this is a vanishing point, and this is a vanishing point. We have lines go to those vanishing points and it gives us the idea, if you've ever seen a checkerboard or a, a unplanted field, you'll notice that these things get smaller as they go away. I'm gonna teach you something real quick which is which I call secret sauce tips. How do you make a grid of equal sized things on a one point perspective, right? How do you make them recede away as if they were the same? So if I had one point perspective here and I made sure that each of these was equal distance from one another, and we're gonna say this is one foot. Let's pretend that this is 12 inches, okay? So we have a dot, a dot, a dot, equal distance apart. But the difficult thing to do, that one was a little off. The difficult- Give yourself the license to flop, it doesn't matter, yeah. just go for it. The difficult thing to do is to make sure that that foot is a foot, 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 as it recedes in distance. And the way you do that is by working it out for the first one, okay? So if I say that this is a foot here, this is a foot here, this is a foot here, so that's a cube. If I was to draw a diagonal line from here all the way to the vanishing point. Oh, interesting. That's a foot, that's a foot, that's a foot, that's a foot, that's a foot. So as these recede into the distance where that line crosses, that foot oh, 
that's so cool. That foot will actually be in perfect proportion. So if I had a one, two, three, four, five, six foot man laying right here, that's one foot there while this is one foot here. So that's sort of how you give the idea of depth with perspective. You can do the same thing with, uh, if, if things are going in, in, in height, you can do the very same thing by creating that diagonal uh, across that horizontal line. So that that is perspective. And then the last thing that we I talked make about. Sure the guy laying down real quick. Could you stretch it in there, in that grid? Yeah. We have his foot here, another foot here. If that represents a couple feet, that means his knee would be here. His other leg would be there. That, that guy would lay there. So that's, this is really rough because it's with pen, but this would be that person laying in the distance, which is a perfect opportunity to let shadow come into play to give the idea of depth that he's laying there with the light shining that way. I'm gonna try something, I hope. No, I can't, can't zoom in. No zooming. Okay, it's all right. Here, let's, there you go. Oh, that's incredible, okay. So that's, that's how you give depth. Now, another way to give depth is um, shadow. And the other word I use, I use shading, but let's, let's try to use the word value. There's something that we have, and it's a fancy, fancy term called atmospheric perspective. And what that means is as things are further away from us, the lighter they get. That's why mountains far, far, far away in the distance look very pale compared to something closer to us. So if I had this square, this square, this square, this square, and this square, and I said that this one is gonna have the darkest value, okay? This one here we're gonna say is the same, same color, let's say it's the same color and the same value, but since we're using atmospheric perspective, we're gonna make it slightly lighter. And see how this looks even further away because of the value? That's called atmospheric perspective. Now the other place for that, using overlap and shadow, let's say we have this cube and this cylinder here. This cube and cylinder, if a hard light was hitting here, this would cast a bit of that cylinder's shadow on there, and that would cast its shadow here. And then if we were to render this along with the contours and give that slight value, suddenly these look more three-dimensional. Oh, so, cool. so those are using these depth cues. You, you, you saw overlap, you saw contour, you saw foreshortening, you saw perspective, you saw shadow and shading and value. Now last, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be combining some of these ideas, okay? so. Uh, the thing that I like to do that people really enjoy is what I call the toaster and can trick. Oh, that's a good one. Oh. So if you take, everybody has a toaster, so they know what their toaster looks like. You know, the boom, toast pops out, right? If you can master drawing a toaster at any angle, that's a great thing, okay? Underneath it, all of that, okay? So here's, here's our toaster. Now, if you can also draw a can at any angle that's the other trick now if you combine these two and put that can underneath the toaster like this and you treat that line as the brow line and the center of that is where the ear goes now you can draw the shape of a head at any angle and that's using modified forms of the cube and the cylinder so if I was to draw eyes here, the nose here, mouth here. Now I have one of the more difficult angles to draw of a, of a head, which is the three-quarter. Or another one that's really difficult is the three-quarter upshot. But if I use the, those simple shapes, suddenly now I, I know that that brow, we're on the underside of that brow and that mouth, it goes here and that's the underside of the chin. And now here's a three-quarter upshot using a simple toaster and a can.
A little more complex is going in and using those forms. Like for example, if I take a simple sphere and I start using contours to wrap which way the, the orientation of this thing and some cylinders, I can start putting together figures. So here we are using cylinders and, and uh, spheres and, and cubes. Let's put that, that, uh, that toaster and, and can right there for his head. So now you have the beginnings of a superhero form. And then if you use shadows, we say the lights above it, suddenly his head is casting a shadow. We see the underside of that shoulder. We see that arm casting a shadow down there. The, the, his pectorals casting a shadow, his stomach casting a shadow the underside of his leg, the underside of his thumb and fist. Suddenly now this looks more three-dimensional. And then if we include, again, contours, this stuff is wrapping around those shapes. It looks, it looks even more three-dimensional. So again, to, to review the things that we discussed today to help things look 3D, Write these down, take, take a second to write them down. Depth cues, overlap, contour, foreshortening, perspective, and shadow. And then there's one more thing that you wanna consider when you're observing the world, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it up right now on my phone because I, I'm, I'm gonna try to remember them, actually. Well, take, I, mean, I just have a quick question. Yeah. Can you tell them some of the, uh, your favorite uh, fam famous characters and magazines that you've worked on? Yes. I'll write them down. That way they, they, ah! they can, can see them. Okay. First thing you gotta do is follow this. Oh, yes, 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 yes. On, on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Which one has 73,000 followers? That would be Instagram. So okay, if, I'm gonna catch you, Dan. We're at 3,100. I'm gonna catch you. I believe you. it. I believe it. Spider-Man. Wolverine, Superman. You actually worked on these. Yes. That's so awesome, Dan. Powerpuff Girls. All because of me! It's the <laughs> truth. Powerpuff Girls, Gen X. Uh, uh, and me then, and a lot of other art teachers, I'm sure. But that is no, wonderful. I had, I had you, my grandfather, and a lot of books. Uh, so those are those, and then if you um, if you watch what about YouTube, TV, how do they see YouTube, you on YouTube, search for this word here, couch doodles. Search for couch doodles on YouTube, and, and you'll find me. Search for couch, couch doodles. doodles. Okay. It's all that's that's the only all thing right. you need to find. Um, oh yeah, the 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 other rules of of observation. I'm trying to remember them. There's curves. These are, these are nuggets, these are just gems, you guys write them down. Verticals, horizontals. Is it possible you can show them how you put these words into one of your, your detailed pen and inks real quick? Would that be a good example? Or you want to go on your phone? No, I'm looking, I'm looking at the time. Are we okay? I think so. Horizontals, diagonals. Dan's going to catch a plane back to Atlanta. He's, we're very grateful. He's squeezing in his last 23 minutes with us here, guys. And he's got to go catch a plane. 13 minutes. Oh, we have 13 minutes. I mean, I'm yeah. saying that we're at, the, we're at the very limit. Okay, so then this is negative space. I would say you went for 23 minutes so far. Oh. I'm, hey, it's all gravy from here. And I'm missing one. I, I'm trying to remember uh, the one I'm missing. Does it help you when I talk in your ear? And say, hey, do this, it do that. It do doesn't. That. It doesn't. So, so curves. When I observe the world around me, I'm trying to find the curves in any situation. So, if I compose a drawing, say like this, and I put a curve here as, as a shape, and I put it against a. Uh, a, uh, a horizontal shape where the hor horizon is and I see any diagonal relationships like if I say the top corner related to this 
barn back here. There's a diagonal there and there's diagonals here. And I also think about proportion that this barn is this big and I'm saying the vanishing point is, is here on the ground. That means everything here at this high level, if I drew a man's boot there, that's, that's where he would be in proportion to that farm. If he was that far away, and if I drew another person out there, it would be that. So that's, that would be proportion. Verticals is anything, when you're looking around you, is anything that goes up and down. Horizontals is anything that goes left and right. Diagonals is anything relationship in a diagonal way. And negative space is that old classic thing you see where if I was to draw, a, a, say, a vase like this, That negative space of this vase that I drew is also the negative space between two faces. So the idea is when you observe things around you, don't just try to draw what you think you see. Because a lot of people, if they say, I'm going to draw an eye, they draw an almond with a circle in it and they think, hey, that's an eye. But in reality, if they look at the negative space between things, they'll notice that there's this shape this shape, this shape, this shape here, and suddenly the shape of an eye is more like that. Using negative space, you're able to observe. So these aren't things you, you actively do when you draw. This is, this is when you observe the world around you. And using these other tools that we had earlier, these are the tools you use to extract what's in your mind and put it on paper and communicate it to people in the same way you see it in your brain. And the way you gather information is through observation, the things you see around you, and you can combine things. Like if I see, for example, an insect, and I wanna draw a monster, I know an insect has multiple eyes, and I've observed that in pictures, but then if I said, what if it had a set of eight eyes, and its pinchers, what if I made its pinchers really big? And what if I gave it four sets of antennae? Suddenly now it's a a crazy space character, right? But the ah, only way the only way I'm gonna be able to know how to make this crazy space character is to actually look at a real bug and know that pinchers look like that. I insect eyes kinda look like that. But then I take with my imagination and I and I change it. And that's, that's the power. So again, practice these things for when you do your drawings. Practice these things for when you are observing the world. Thank you, Dan. No Th problem. Dan Frag Frager. Sega Frager. Frager. Thank you. Here he is right here. Shake my hand. I, I just love you. I'm a big fan too, of yours. I'm a big Thank fan you. of Thank you. I'm going to keep these. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna get, a, I'm gonna write a book with this guy. I love you, and thank you very much. You're bye welcome. Bye, bye everybody.